In our opening text, Peter, the Apostle Peter, quotes Solomon, King Solomon, by saying, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And if we think of King Solomon, how would we describe Solomon at the beginning of his reign? A very humble king. Just with our children last night when we did our family devotions together, we covered the story of Solomon after King David's reign and how God appeared to him in a dream and uh, told Solomon that he could ask for anything. And he asked for what? Wisdom. Wisdom so that he could rule God's people uprightly and correctly. What a humble man, what a humble king. And then later, if we continue to read about his reign, we know that somehow this wisdom dissipated and disappeared. He became proud. His pride and his arrogance led to his fall. And it's a warning to us all. And yet here we find these beautiful words, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He then states in verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Loved ones, there are two different types of humility. There is, first of all, the vertical humility, that is our humility toward God, of which uh, Peter was referring to here. And then there's horizontal humility, our humility toward our fellow man. And it is our vertical humility or our humility toward God that lays the foundation of our humility toward one another. In other words, the way our relationship is toward God will tell us very quickly how we treat our brother and sister. Are we humble toward God? If so, then we will be more likely to be humble toward our neighbor. With the Lord's help, we want to begin a short series on humility. Humility is such an important thing. If we lose our humility, God cannot use us. One of the greatest kings that ever lived, King Solomon, he fell into such deep despair because he lost his humility and his wisdom. And we want to begin this series by considering vertical humility first. Our humility toward God. What is our relationship toward God like? And in this first study of our series, we want to look at three statements that three different people from the New Testament either said or wrote and these three statements illustrate to us how their relationship toward God was. And we want to learn from, from them so that our humility toward God can improve as well. Our first statement comes from John the Baptist. Now in John chapter 3, we're, we're told how John the Baptist's disciples came to him and told him that Jesus and his disciples, they were also baptizing people. And that more people were now going to Jesus and his disciples than to John. And then as his response, he tells his disciples in John 3, verse 30, He must increase and I must decrease. John's answer illustrates his humility toward God. John could have gotten upset. He could have gotten jealous. He could have gotten angry that more people were going to Jesus and his disciples to be baptized than to him. But instead, he reminded his followers of the true purpose of his baptism. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance, yes, but it was to get people's hearts ready for Jesus. And here he was. And he was beginning his ministry in John 1, verses 26 and 27, he tells his listeners, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. For John, God was the center of his life. God took the first place, and John had no problem he had no problem stepping out of the spotlight 
when Jesus' popularity increased. The scripture says, at one point, all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to John and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. He had great popularity. Even the, the Pharisees and the scribes went out to see what this was all about. But that time had ended. It was time for him to decrease and for the Lord to increase. Is God, loved ones, at the center of our lives? Is he at the center of our attitude, our plans and goals in life, our desires? Is he at the center of our work? What do I mean? One source gives the following illustration. There were three men working on a church building. They were all doing the same thing. And a person comes up to them and asks them all separately what they were doing. And the first one said, well, I'm laying bricks. Then he went to the second one, and the second worker replied, I'm earning money to put food on the table. And the third answered, I'm building a place where people will worship God and where people will help each other. They were doing the same thing. Three men laying bricks. But only one of them realized that what he did was for God and his kingdom. Now a second point that we can learn from John's statement is how important it is for us to have a proper perspective of who God is. And this is further seen in the next verse, where he says in verse 31, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Now John realized and accepted God's supreme authority in his life. When we acknowledge God's supremacy, when we see and recognize his magnificence, his unlimited power and knowledge, we get a proper view of ourselves in comparison. How we truly are. How small we are. You know, God created the universe by simply speaking a few words, and it was there and it was good. This last week, I saw a photo from one of the rovers on the planet Mars that's going around and taking pictures and so forth. And one of the pictures that this rover took was of the skies. <coughs> and it pinpointed Earth, a tiny little dot. On that dot are over, what, seven billion people? And all of us. And with a few words God said, let it be, and it was. This is the power of God, and, and, I, and at times we, we tend to forget it. We say God is all-powerful, but what does that really mean? We are so small in comparison, we need to have a proper perspective of who God is and what God wants to do in our lives. It's so important. The prophet Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And this shows us, again, how, it's, how important it is to have a proper perspective of God. These are the words of God. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Now what could humble us more than when we compare ourselves to God? When we see how small we are in comparison to his greatness. John wrote the first statement, the Apostle Paul wrote the second. Paul wrote this statement of humility in his first letter to the Corinthians. 
Now, prior to his statement, he explains how the Corinthians received the gospel message from him, the last apostle to have encountered the risen Lord. And though Paul refers to himself as the least of the apostles, he adds then, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. In these words, Paul displays his humility toward God by expressing his dependence on God. He knew that everything that he was and everything that he had achieved for the kingdom of God was because of God's grace and provision in his life. He knew how terrible his actions were prior to his conversion and that he persecuted the church. This was a thought that he often shared in his letters. (coughs) In verse 9 he writes, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But because of the grace of God, Christ appeared to him in a vision of light which changed his life forever. We know who Paul was before his conversion. Who was he? He persecuted Christians. Scripture even gives him a different name. A Pharisee? He was a Pharisee? Absolutely. Saul. Saul a Pharisee. Very good. He writes a bit about his life in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. And we can see his former pride in these these, uh, words. He says, If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless, he says. But then, after saying all of this, he concludes with the words, But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Loved ones, if we depend on our abilities, on our knowledge, on our strength, on our provision, on our wealth, how are we any different than the countless people around us who do not know God, who do not accept his leading in their lives, who do not rely on God's provision, but rather rely on themselves? How are we any different? At times, we can forget to rely on God. And I came across one account. It goes, there was a pastor who was moving to a new location, and he saved the heaviest piece of furniture for the end, and it was his office desk. And he was there all by himself at first, and he tried moving this thing, and he couldn't. And then his four-year-old son, seeing that he was struggling with this thing, he wanted to help. So they both uh, take hold of this big desk, And they grunt and and they push and they slowly move it. But seeing that they weren't getting too far, the boy tells his dad, this four-year-old boy tells his dad, Papa, you're in my way. (laughs) And so this pastor lets go of the desk and lets the little boy try to move it on his own. And it doesn't go anywhere. And then they both try again and they are able to succeed at their task. And you think, well, this is just a a normal, like a little illustration, a story. But our situation can sometimes be even worse. The Almighty God wants to help us to accomplish the things that he wants us to do. And sometimes we look at God and we say to him, God, you're in my way. And we rely completely on our strengths and on our abilities and nothing happens. And we wonder why nothing happens. Because God has let go. And he wants us to struggle and recognize that without him, we can do nothing. Right? Isn't that how scripture goes? But when we let him take hold of whatever we're doing and lead us, we not only have success, but God is glorified. And that's what God wants of us. A humble heart realizes its dependency on God. Now, the second way that Paul's sentence illustrates his humility toward God is 
is that in it, all glory and praise is directed back to God. Now, we know Paul achieved great things for the kingdom of God, and though he wasn't one of the original apostles, some would argue that he was the most influential apostle because of his many letters and his journeys, and yet, in all things, he gave glory to God for what he accomplished. He knew that on his own strength and abilities, he could do nothing. The entire verse of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 states, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul gave all praise and glory for his work to God. A humble heart reflects praise back to God, the giver of all good things. He really is the giver of all good things. When we see Paul reflect the praise back to God again in the words, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Organizations today, even Christian organizations that build themselves on one person, really set, them, set themselves up for failure. Now, just recently, I heard how the head pastor of a, of a huge international work was, was uh, found out that he had been living a second or a double life. And everything that his organization did, all the good that they did, was for naught, because the one person that they built this organization on fell, and everything else crumbled. Loved ones, that's what happens when we build on something besides Jesus Christ. Jesus never crumbles. We need to do everything with Christ in mind. We need to build everything on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And a humble heart reflects all praise back to the giver, who is the person who does the work through us. Paul says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. It was him who did it. It doesn't matter what position we might have in church. What matters is that we glorify God through whatever it is that we do. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, But if him you are in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Everything that we have in our Christian walk comes from God. Our salvation is because of Jesus. That we can be his children is because of his love and grace. Our sanctification is because of God sending his Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit come from him. The gifts that we have come from him. The work that he has is his. Everything is his. He simply wants to use us and then give all glory and praise back to him. God should be glorified for what he does in us and through us. The third statement that we want to look at before we close is Peter's statement. In Acts chapter 5, we're told how a number of the apostles had been thrown in prison and brought before the high priests and Jewish council the next day. There the high priest asked them, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name, meaning the name of Jesus Christ? And that's when Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than man. Now at first glance, we might not think that these are humble words. We might think that they are bold words spoken in the face of persecution. But uh, Peter's response shows us his allegiance to God and God's will, which can only come from a truly humble heart and attitude toward God. Loved ones, a proud a proud heart desires to rule over itself. A cowardly heart is swept along with the flow of the majority, but a humble heart accepts Christ's lordship in his life and does all that he can to be obedient to his will, to God's will, even when it costs him something like we heard in the first hour about being willing to suffer for Jesus, being willing to suffer for our faith. One writer says, Obeying God can lead to unpleasant and difficult circumstances. But if we desire to manifest truly humble spirits, we must do it because God is the authority in our lives and we are not. And Peter's commitment and, uh, and obedience to God displayed in his words 
could have cost him his life. But that was the price that he was willing to pay to carry out God's will. Now, it's sometimes very hard to do the right thing. We know that it's tax season, and it's so easy for us to perhaps file our taxes in such a way, knowing that uh, if we don't claim everything or state all of our earnings or so forth, that uh, our return might be greater. But Jesus taught very clearly about taxes. He, taught, he took a, a piece of money and he, and he asked his disciples whose inscription is on it. And they said, Caesar's. And then using this illustration, Jesus, our Lord, says to his disciples, Give therefore to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Our lives. He has saved us. He has made us his children. We call ourselves his. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is his. Being obedient to God in his word in all matters of life is what Jesus wants us to, to, to be. That shows true humility towards him. One author describes what happened to a certain lawyer who was hired to deal with the will of uh, a deceased relative. And these people, they wanted the lawyer to, to lie about this will so that they wouldn't be taxed so much. And these were good clients of his, long-time clients of his, but he refused. He refused to lie for them. And it cost them these clients. But he could go away from there knowing that he still had his relationship and his loyalty to God. And that this test that God had put in his way was conquered with great victory. Are we loyal to God? Are we humble in all things? And do we display our loyalty to him in everything that we do? Even if it costs us something? What are we willing to give up for the Lord if it means that we can remain his children? To obey God's command and his word and will and direction requires communication with God. For how can we obey anyone properly if there's no communication? A humble heart takes time to commune with the Lord, to speak to and listen to the Lord in prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through his word. Now if we go back to the account of Peter and the apostles during the time that they were in prison, we read the following in scripture. An angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And then, what did they do? Scripture clearly states, And when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and they taught. They perfectly obeyed their instructions because the instructions were communicated clearly to them by God through this angel that appeared to them. Now, we might be thinking, well, an angel has never appeared to us in a dream before, telling us what the Lord wants of us, and that might never happen. But what we do have is 24-hour access to the Almighty's throne of grace. At any time of the day, at any time of the night, we can go on our knees in prayer and seek the Lord's will and his leading in our lives. And if we have quiet hearts, humble hearts before the Lord and open ears, God will lead us. God will speak to us, and he will show us exactly what we should do. God wants to lead our lives. There are times where we forget to seek God's will in our lives, where we start to just plan our lives the way we want to, and then things kind of fall apart and we wonder, what, what's going on? I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm serving the Lord. At times like these, I, I then am reminded, well, did I even once think of asking God about this, if I should do this at all? James warns us of this. He says in James 4, verses 13 to 17, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Tomorrow. 
For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you who boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. You know, these words are often taken out of their context as a way to perhaps judge others for not doing something they, they knew they should do. But loved ones, in context it means if we know to bring our plans first to the Lord and seek his will in our lives and don't do it, and if we do this kind of a thing constantly and don't even inquire of God, that's sinful. Because it shows to God that we really don't have humble hearts. We do what we want to do and the Lord can, can take back seat. He wants to lead our lives. He wants to bring all of our thoughts and concerns and, and prayers to him. And he wants to tell us and lead us and direct our lives. Then he will be glorified. Then God will be able to use us. A humble heart seeks God's will and direction. And, and then displays one's dis dependence on God and allegiance to him through obedience. This morning, in our brief study, we've examined three statements found in the New Testament that illustrate the various ways we can improve our humility to God. John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. And from his words, we learn that humility before God requires a God-centered lifestyle where everything is done with God and his kingdom in mind. It also includes having a proper perspective of God's authority and supremacy in our lives. The Apostle Paul wrote, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his words remind us that humility before God rests on accepting our dependency on God and then thanking and praising him in all situations in life. And finally, Peter responds to the Jewish council, we ought to obey God rather than men, illustrating the importance, the great importance of humbly obeying God's instructions and will, which of course requires a listening ear so that we can hear God speaking to us. Humility. God says, blessed are those who walk humbly before him. We're just a speck on a planet that's also just a speck. And God wants us to remember that. And although we are so small, he loves us so much that he sent his son to save our souls. It's a humbling thought. God wants us to remain humble before him. That's when he's able to use us, and that's when he's glorified through everything that we do. Amen.